Here we go! Welcome to Close Combat. I'm Sergeant First Class Randy Randolph. Coming up, we'll have all the lightweight action in the Army Championship Combatives Tournament. But first, a closer look at the training which takes place in gyms like this on Army posts worldwide. The modern Army Combatives program has been around since the mid-90s, but it's constantly changing to adapt to different needs downrange. Take a look. Modern Army Combatives program is as much about developing warrior ethos and confidence and uh, agile adaptive leaders as it is about developing fighting skills. The, the basic and tactical course, the, what used to be the level one and two, are taught out around the force in the units by their indigenous instructors. And what we do here at the combative school is we train those instructors. And then the, uh, the last week, we, we kind of incorporate everything into uh, scenario-based training. So they'll use all the tools that they've uh, acquired through the course, how to fight with a rifle, how to fight with a pistol, how to fight with a knife. They get in a predicament in training, and they see that they can get out of it so that they could, uh, again, control a situation. All right, sir, get your hands up. Hands up. And from that, I said, wow, I, I'm not afraid now. Get out of the vehicle, sir. Get out of the vehicle. It makes a big difference when you go in there and you can physically grab someone and handle them and, and bend them to your will. Your other hand, sir. Without hurting them. Because like I said, uh, I mean, people see that. And they see that, you know, you're forcing your will upon them, but that they're, they're, you're not abusing them. Our soldiers go out and have life and death fights routinely. It's got to be real. Because if it's not, we're going to hear about it immediately. Somebody's going to have, somebody's going to get killed. There's no gender discrimination in battle, or when it comes to combatives training. Females are often paired with males, and as you're about to see, they're more than able to hold their own. It started when I went to level one, and it caught my attention. It's just not a lot of females that do combatives. And then just getting the used to throwing around guys and it's more like showing the guys that females can do combatives also. I started doing uh, anti-attack, anti-rape courses, and then I started teaching. And from there, it just kept going on until I finally said I want to compete at the age of 17. Got my parents to sign my contract and competed. One of my old NCOs, he was like, you should go, you know, train. And then I wanted to do level one and level two. And then just, I did the tournament at Fort Hood and then they opened up the new weight class, which is like one, 110 Bantam weight. And the coaches were like, hey, I think you would do really, you know, I think you'll do well. And why don't you just try it? And I was like, what the heck? Intimidating, not so much. It was just more of a, you know that in their mind, they're soldiers, we're all soldiers. So our mentality is win, win, win all the time. And then for him, it's not just win. Now it's win and don't lose to a girl. They can't really hold you down. And it's really easy to squirm out of their, their locks and stuff, and they're so big, and it's, it's hard to keep you down sometimes. But unless they get all that weight on you, yeah, it, it's pretty hard. For me, it's to prove a lot of guys that a lot of females can do it, too. And it is all about the technique. It isn't, um, they show you different ways to get around, of course, if, um, smaller and like the instructors are always giving advice. If you haven't done it, I guess it could be, but for me it's not because I've trained with males, I've, you know, rolled with them constantly and it's, it's just, you know, it's another one of the things that you're going to deal with in a tournament that's co-ed. It actually raised my confidence a lot because I was intimidated by a lot of the guys, especially this class, I'm the only female and I was like, oh. It, this is going to be a tough, tough month for me. Because a lot of these guys can probably practically pick me up and just throw me off of them. I'm a, a huge confidence builder. I think after this course, it'll bring my confidence up quite a bit. You're going to be going into a building and going down an alleyway where uh, they can get a hold of your weapon. They can even, you know, get a, any kind of distance between you and them. It'd be great, but if they close that distance, you're going to need it. 
You need to implement anything that you learn in the Army Combatives. Get around them and get them on the ground, try and disable what they're able to do to you. When you're out, like even as a soldier, you know, soldiers are like, oh, they look at you wrong or something, they try to start an issue, a problem, and you're just like, I don't, in your head, you're like, I don't need to. You just ignore it because you know, like, if it really got to that level, you knew that battle's already won, so why even bother with it? Coming up, a closer look at how Army Combatives is used in Army Ranger School. Plus, don't miss all the lightweight action from the Army Combatives Championship. I'm Van Stokes, here with Matt Larson, director of the Army Combatives Program. Matt, you were ringside at the annual Army Combatives Championship in Fort Benning, Georgia. Some of these fighters now came through some very big weight classes. Just how difficult is it to come through the weight classes, and how intense is this competition? Well, Van, this has been called the most intense competition in the martial arts world. Each of these men probably had five or six, seven fights on Friday. Yesterday, they had one or two pancreation fights. And today, just to get to this point, they had to go through all that. So you'll see some of them a bit banged up even when they enter the ring. So it's fair to say they've come a long way through this competition alone. That's it. Thanks, Matt. Let's meet the fighters in the first lightweight match. Joseph Clark and Thomas Soto faced off for the bronze medal in the consolation fight. Here's what they had to say going into the match. I'm going up against a uh, very good, uh, very decorated wrestler. So I'm going to see what he has in the stand-up. I don't have any feedback on his stand-up. And um, I've done some, some stand-up here recently. So I'm going to test my stand-up with him. I'm not going to try to force a shot because, you know, I don't want to tire myself out. And a um, uh, good game plan for me would be to take it into deep waters. Um, and, uh, you know, the cardio hopefully will pay off. I just came off a deployment and I always think it could be worse because I know that facing the enemy is it, it's a lot more difficult situation than it is out here on the mat. I'd much rather, you know, practice, train and fight somebody on the mat and get used to that kind of adrenaline and you know the X factor. What if this happens? What if his friend comes in and you know what if uh, what if he pulls a gun on me? You know, what if they're, they're supposed to be friendly and they're not? So I'm always able to, you know, through this training, I'm able to have a dynamic outlook on all situations. And like I said before, that's why I think it's important to be out here competing and, and practicing. The mindset of being a stand-up competitor, what do you see in this bout? Well, most of the, what they know about each other is what they've seen in the grappling rounds. So as they get into this round, sometimes it's really uncharted territory for them, not knowing what stand-up skills you ha they have. So, so that's what you're going to see, feeling out, trying to decide who's got what as they go into the fights. Uncharted, new waters, whatever it may be, let's get to the action. Joseph Clark wears the red belt. And Thomas Soto, Fort Bliss, Texas, in the blue belt. And Soto, as we just heard a short while ago, back from deployment, brings that combatant's mindset into this bout, does he not, Matt? He does. You know, that's a lot of these guys are much more serious about the fighting than people imagine. You know, imagine he just came back from deployment. Who knows? Could be two, three weeks ago, he was over there fighting for his life. Well, right now, he's fighting for a bronze medal here in the lightweight division. Lightweight division goes up to what pound? This is up to 145, which uh, 145 pounds for men and, and a 9% overage for women, so you know, roughly in the high 150s for females. Um, I saw uh, Clark fight in the Fort Lewis McCord uh, uh, championships. He's a real tough kid, really tough competitor. And I, I, I think what you're going to see at this fight is it's really going to, it's really going to open up here in a little bit. Well, as you indicated, Joseph Clark from Joint Base Lewis McCord in the great state of Washington in the Reds' belt in the down position and swinging. 
is Soto and responding is Clark. But windmills, if you will, mostly air on those punches. But trying to fire whenever you break like that is a really good technique. And, and oftentimes your opponent is wide open at that time, so it's a good time to throw punches. It looks like Soto is the first to draw blood in this contest. Clark seems to be stalking him, though. Keeps moving forward. Soto looking for a place to pick in. He's picking his punches, sticking and moving. And a quick with upper body grab by Clark. And a quick jab as he is now worked into the ropes. You can see the real interplay of striking skills and takedowns. And you can also see there, they're grasping each other's clothes, how that plays out in a fight. Mentally, if you're a boxing aficionado or wrestling fan, you, you almost look for them to separate themselves. But when you blend these two together, along with the martial arts, you've got Army combatants. And that's the difference between what is called cross-training and integrated training. In cross-training, you box, you wrestle, you do jiu-jitsu. But in integrated training, each of those things is combined. So your, your takedowns aren't wrestling setups, they're boxing and kickboxing setups. Your, your jiu-jitsu moves come off of the wrestling takedown. Each of those things interplay. Soto kickboxing a little bit, then goes back to the upper body. Clark, meanwhile, tries to deliver a combination of punches with a quick kick to the left foot, the think, left knee. I think Clark is delivering a little bit more disciplined punches, and you can see he's getting more damage. And you, and you can see the splotches of blood that are on the back shirt of Soto, probably coming from the nose of Clark. I don't see any open lacerations or open cuts. I haven't seen any cuts yet, but uh, you know, it's, it's funny. People always look at this and, and think it looks very dangerous, but we have surprisingly few injuries. There are almost no injuries. Now I take that back. Now you get a good look at the face of Joseph Clark, and it does look like he's got a slight cut on the right eye, off to the side. It looks like it's outside of his eye, so it shouldn't be much of a problem. They'll, they'll stop it if it's bleeding into his eye, but it looks like that one's just going off to the side. You can see there working for hand position. Now, normally the, the, the man on the bottom is really going to try to work to get free. What is the objective of Soto right now in the top position? Well, in the top position, he can either land blows or he could try to get past the legs. And it looks like he's working for a position to land blows. Now the bottom man has a lot of advantages as well. Even though he's defending himself, he has his hips to be able to attack with. So he could get to the arm locks. Now you can see him try for an arm lock there. And it looks like Soto's past the guard and back on his feet. Quick upper kick right there. Less than a minute in this first round in this lightweight division. Bronze medal match as both come back to the standing position. Pretty solid exchanges here. I think that uh, Clark is getting slightly the better, but only slightly the better of this round. Well, when it comes to blood right now, Soto's getting the better because Clark has that open wound on the right side of his head. But as you said, it's not bleeding into his eye, so the bout continues. And there's our bell to end the first period. Good exchange of knees there at the end. So both combatants return to their corners. Soto not looking the worse for the wear. He looks a little tired, but doesn't look like he's taken much damage. He was on the top during that exchange in the guard. And there's a good look at the cut on the eye or off to the side of Joseph Clark. Yeah, the cut doesn't look too bad. Looks like it's bled a little bit, but they're not, they don't seem to be paying much attention to it. So I no, think no, they, they think don't. It's all and right. now, in, in, in boxing, Matt, they're going to come back and they're going to try to close that, put some gel on that, that will basically stop the bleeding number one and try to close it just a little bit. Yeah, if they thought it was in a bad place where the opponent could take advantage of it, they probably would be. Well, let me ask you this What are the chances that when they start the next round, that Soto is going to come out and try to take advantage of that cut? He could. You see less of that in this type of competition. It's, uh, it's generally frowned upon. And there's a lot of aspects of, of many sports, you know, play in the game, if you will, that are counter, counter to, the, to the ethic within combatives. And this is about developing the best fighters, not the best gamesmen. Well, I'll tell you what, you, you heard in the pre-match interview, and there's the lift and the drop by Thomas Soto.
on Joseph Clark as he takes him down to the mat. You, you heard the respect, I think, that Joseph Clark had for his opponent, but he's not in the least bit awed by the challenge that he has. No, I, th I think that you have to have a lot of confidence in yourself to get to this point. These soldiers, you know, th the fact that they may go in there and get beat up doesn't enter their mind. They're thinking about what they're going to do to the other guy. And, of course, the only thing that matters right now is the moment and the fight that they happen to be in. But Clark has Soto's arm wrapped up on that left side in an overhook, so he's only really fighting with one side from the top there. And that... That cut off the right side of his right eye does not seem to be bleeding a lot. It seems to have stopped as they're brought back to their feet now. They had a lot of good exchanges on their feet in the first round, so hopefully we'll see some more of that. Scoring is a 10-point must system, meaning the winner of every round must receive 10 points. The loser will receive their points accordingly, 9, 8, 7, depending on whether it was dominant, controllable, or whatever. That's in the eyes of our three judges. All right, there's three judges, one on each, one each on different sides of the uh, ring, so they have a different view. And they'll score 10-9 if it's a slight advantage, 10-8 if it's a dominant round, 10-7 uh, if it's very dominant, maybe a bunch of takedowns, some real damage. You get much beyond that, it'll probably have stopped the fight. Thomas Soto again in the top position. And Clark down on his back. Now, Matt, did, did they have a jury of appeals? And there you see the, the flow of blood starting again. And I think that comes from basically the heads rubbing against each other. That cut might have opened just a little bit. That's right. But you know, your head bleeds a lot. So it's not always indicative of it being a bad cut even. My point was in the sport of boxing, you've got a jury of appeals. Is there such a jury of appeals in no. Army combatives? No, in combatives, it goes to the judges. It's like in baseball, if the guy is out at first, the referee call or judge calls him out, and well, then he's out. Look at that, he's working that arm lock. That's called the reverse spin arm bar. It looks like he's out of it. Whoa, nice spin around. Reversal, if you will, by Let's see if he Joseph drops Clark. Punches down through there. Clark, who spent a lot of time in, on his back on the bottom, now has the upper body control over Thomas Soto. A pretty good exchange here, but yeah, he, Clark is definitely showing some good grappling skills, staying in better position now than he was in the first round. And he's showing stamina, strength, quickness, and a, and a real strong combative mindset. In other words, a little blood is not going to slow him down or stop him. You know, it's in, it's funny in the fight. Whenever you're bleeding, you don't even notice it. And when you when you see somebody. When the fights get stopped because of blood, they're always upset because, because they don't even know they're hurt. Why is that? Well, you, you don't feel it very much, and the, the amount of damage you're actually taking is, is very small and those sort of things. Now, you feel it when you get hit, you know, the, the impact you feel, but you don't necessarily feel the damage unless it's debilitating. And, and so I guess a lot of times it's a lot it looks a lot worse than it may actually be, such as right now you get a good look over the eye of Joseph Clark as Soto right now tries to main control, maintain control, maintain control. Soto a, in the blue. There's a parallel when, when people are injured in a, in a fight overseas, they so, oftentimes won't even know they're injured. You'll, you'll, you'll know you're injured because you try to do something and whatever portion of your body is, is injured doesn't allow you to do it. But the, you know, adrenaline, the, the, the heat of the battle, sometimes they won't even know they're hurt. So this very much simulates the heat of a particular battle situation that these soldiers could find themselves in. Well, as, as close as training can, imagine what other kind of training involves this much emotion, this much fear. All the things that are going on mentally in the fight is actually more important than what's going on physically. Well, they're under 30 seconds now here in this round, the second round. And Trust me on this, when Clark goes to his corner, they will have to treat that eye now. I think so. It looks like it's getting in his eye now. There's your slap of the canvas, indicating less than 10 seconds remaining before the end of this round. The pounding continues, and Soto continues in the top position as the bell sounds to end the round. That was a very close round. Soto was on top quite a bit of it, and then Clark turned it around and was on top during the middle and was threatening that arm lock at the, at the end. A very tough decision for the judges there. 
see if we can get a listen to his coaches. You see that blood just kind of—they clean it up, but then it just kind of trickles. Yeah, it seems like they would have wanted to do more for that cut. Follow up the cross. Okay. He's always throwing that kick to the man. Wait for the kick. Wait for that kick and then counter with a follow-up with the cross. And Soto's coaches seem to think that'll do the trick. And they say in Muay Thai that punches beat kicks. So we'll see if it works out for him. <laughs> they say a lot of things, I'm sure. Punches beat kicks. And knees beat punches. And knees beat punches. All right. Kicks beat knees. It's all a big circle. Well, let's see right now if Joseph Clark can beat Thomas Soto for the bronze medal in this lightweight division. We go into the final round. Very cautious. It's very cautious. Do you think in their mind's eye, they think this is a split decision right now? Or, or the, one of them, perhaps Soto won the first bout, maybe Clark won the second bout? I think if I was a coach on either side, I'd be telling my fighter he was losing just to get him motivated. It, regardless whether re, regardless whether your fighter's Joseph Clark or Thomas Soto. That's right. What, the last thing you want is a complacent fighter going into the final round of a of a very close fight. You know, Matt, I've said this so many times. It's really not how the competition starts. It's how the competition finishes. And when it's very, very even in the minds of the judges, the contestant who scored last often will get the judges not. And it works that way round by round in, in these competitions. And some other forms of competition, for example, Muay Thai, they rate the, the latter rounds more. In this, it's even. If you come out strong first round, but in each round, you have a chance to sort of steal the round at the end. Now you see a slight look of fatigue, perhaps, on the eyes of Joseph Clark. It's hard to judge, of course, from our position. But stamina, conditioning, gas means a lot right now. It's also relative to each other. You can be entirely smoked. But if you're less smoked than him, it looks like Soto almost has Clark's back. He's working. See, you see what he's doing with the legs there. So he's getting those legs on the inside. Those are called hooks. And that's a, a very dominant position. Matt, when a, when a soldier wins a medal, in a case like this, a bronze or a gold medal, and goes back to his installation, what kind of bragging rights or what, what kind of treatment does he receive from his, uh, from his comrades back on his installation? Well, you can imagine, being the toughest guy out of 1.2 million is pretty uh, big bragging rights. And so, you know, it's funny. Mostly what the what the competitors win, they don't win very many prizes or anything. They mostly win a hearty handshake and you know a pat on the back and a bronze medal that says, "Hey, you know you were one of the top guys." And and this is really called taking it to the next level because they actually earn the right to come to this competition by winning at their own installation That's around right. the army. That's right. And each post has championships. Now, it looks like he's working on a choke here. He's got the back position. He's fighting for the choke. See what's going on with those hands there. He's trying to subdue him, as you said, with that choke hold. See, he's working that. He's, he's got to get that under his chin to be able to finish the choke. Well, the eye that has been cut, that's closest to the mat. So in a sense, it has some protection. Soto can't get to that eye, but he's got Clark pretty well wrapped up. Yeah, Clark's in danger here. Very, very bad danger with that. Rear mount and the rear naked choke. That, that's almost the most dominant position. Now, you can see Soto keeps crossing his feet. If he keeps doing that, that's a mistake. Clark may be able to attack the ankles if he does. Let, let me ask you this. You talked about the winner going back to the installation after having won here. What about if they lose? How are they received back in the unit and at the installation? Well, the loser in this tournament is the second or third best guy in the Army or fourth best guy in the Army. So that's still pretty good. I don't think any of these guys go back and get anything but accolades. I, I, I agree. I agree with you on that. I, I think those that participate, those that enter the ring, it's hard to call them losers. They might have come out on the backside of a particular bout. You can see now, look, look, Clark is on the bottom, but he's really doing the most damage here. He's doing quite a bit, actually, really active from the bottom there. He's hitting with both hands, the backside of his glove. All of that's legal. They're all legal striking blows. 
You can see, you know, generally when you're on the bottom, you're losing, but but he's on the bottom and getting the best of, of his opponent from here. Under one minute in the final round here, and into the torso goes Soto, and into the head, a backhand, goes Clark. I mean, this has turned into a bit of a slugfest, has it not? I'll tell you what. It's clear, too, that Clark is getting the best of Soto on this on this portion. So Look how tired Soto looks. He's punching the body and not doing very much. Meanwhile, Clark is putting it on him. Less than 20 seconds remaining. This The crowd comes alive. They're looking at a slugfest here, and they appreciate every part of it. Soto's trying to work to get past the guard, but it may be too late for that. He's passed. I don't know what he can do there. Pass the guard, but the bell sounds. It could be a little bit too much, just a little bit too late for Thomas Soto. Clark back to his feet. Jogs back to the corner of the ring. They're both trying to get the crowd on their side now, try to influence the judges. They both feel pretty good about their performance, do they not? Well, it was a good fight, and both of them have a lot to, to, uh, to brag about. They both did very well. Well, they're trying to get the crowd on their side, understandably so. Let's the listen. winner, by split decision, in the lightweight Looks division. Like he's worried. In the red belt, representing JBM, Joseph Clark. Joseph Clark, the winner, and he is an excited young soldier. <laughs> I think he's pretty happy about the win. He had to fight hard, and he earned every bit of that. I think he knows it, Matt. I think he may have turned it there at the end with those blows from the guard. They each get their medals. Gold and silver. A slugfest, a tough bout from the very get-go, but you got to hand it to Clark. He never said never. No, he fought it out to the end, and I think he really pulled it away with those strikes from the guard at the very end. Punches and hammer fists back and forth, really doing some good damage. He fought through the blood. He fought through the adversity. Well, let's hear from our winner, Joseph Clark. Excellent, excellent fight. You guys were just going blow for blow there. What went through your mind when you, just, when you found out you won? Well, I, uh, I felt that all the hard work uh, in my rounds, although I was you know, on the bottom majority of the time, my aggression, you know, I was happy to see that paid off in the eyes of the judges, okay? Any shout outs? Uh, I'd like to say hi to my wife, Bobby. She couldn't make it to, to this one. And she's always been a big supporter. I want to thank my coaches, Sergeant Roger, Sergeant Hansen, my teammate, and good luck to Big Jackson, heavyweight fight for first. Let's hear it for him, let's go. Congratulations, back to you. Well, his wife may not have made it to the competition, but I know they're all proud of him back home. Very, very good fight. Very good performance from that Fort Lewis McCord team. Understandably so. Well, coming up later in the show, we'll be back with all the action from the gold medal fight in the lightweight class. Stick around. Fort Benning, Georgia is home to the Modern Army Combative Schoolhouse. It's also home to the Army Ranger School. Candidates train in combatives as part of their physical and mental assessment. Take a look. Well, hey, where you going to? I'm not done with you. Tell me what you want to do. Never been afraid of you. Just because you walk around. The uh, first three days is our ranger assessment phase. And uh, what that is is we basically test them physically to see if they will have the, uh, the physical ability to complete the entire ranger course. But it's really all about their leadership and their mental ability. The third night, we road march out from here out to Camp Darby. It's about 15 and a half mile road march for them. And then once we get there, we basically weeded out all the uh, week, and now we start right into the training. So then they'll start going through the patrolling. That's when they'll really get into the sleep deprivation, the food deprivation, so we can put that little bit of stress on to simulate combat stress. And then we'll see how they perform. they'll be entering and clearing rooms in Florida phase, and they're gonna run into an opponent and they're gonna to have to take him down using Kabaddi's techniques. And we'll bring them in here, we'll test their leadership skills, we'll give them some new techniques to learn, and really the biggest thing for Ranger School is you learn about yourself. And uh, that's what each one of these soldiers is gonna do. They're gonna learn how they react when they're, when they're lacking sleep, when they're lacking food, 
and when they're under those stressful conditions, they learn that they can actually make decisions, make the right decisions, and lead other soldiers. We're starting to hit the mental hump right now. Uh, like I said, they've been up since about 2 this morning. They won't get to bed tonight until about midnight. And uh, then they'll be back up about 2 again. So they're going to start working on about 2 to 4 hours of sleep for the next 60 days. Just because you walk around, everyone you're talking down. Don't you even make a sound, I will drop you to the ground. Uh, just knowing that you're taught to defend yourself is always a good thing to have. Because you never know what situation you may find yourself in regular day life. Especially if you're working in law enforcement, um, you know, you never know when you can come into, uh, uh, I guess, physical contact with somebody. And uh, it's always a good uh, skill to have. So, because you just never know what could happen at any time. Combatives, I'd say, is a good program to have at all times because you, you never know when you might need something. Um, I guess, as others have said, it's, it's a good tool for the toolbox. You, you never know what circumstances you might cross and you might, you might need to be able to go hand to hand. With the job that I have and a lot of my friends have, we're just trying to come home. So, you know, we're just eliminating the enemy and trying to come home at the same time and bring each other home. So anything we got to make that happen and to accomplish the goal overseas, that's what we gotta do. Up next, this year's championship trophy has special meaning to the combative school. Plus, more lightweight action in the Army tournament. Stick around for more Close Combat. The Army Combatives Championship Trophy holds special meaning to those participating in the tournament. The Pedro Lacerda Trophy is named for an instructor who left his mark on the combative school. He was a, a Brazilian young man who joined the United States Army, came, joined the United States Army because of 9-11. Uh, he wanted to be a soldier and he became a soldier. He volunteered to be a paratrooper and he became a paratrooper. He volunteered to be an Army Ranger and he became an Army Ranger. He was a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He was a quiet, humble, uh, professional, a great husband and a great dad and a world-class fighter. He was a trainer of uh, combatives in the 75th Ranger Regiment, and uh, he died unexpectedly of a brain aneurysm. And so um, because of the uh, quiet professional that he was, the, the, uh, the warrior flame that burned in his heart, we have named the championship trophy for him. And, and so many people knew him and, and loved him and respected him. And so I think it's a good thing. While he was at Fort Benning, Pedro Lacerda took advantage of some of the dozens of courses offered to soldiers through the Maneuver Center of Excellence. Here's a live fire demonstration of a few of them, including Airborne, Infantry, Striker Brigade, and the Combative School. Get down, get down, get down. Yeah, Up next, see the competition in action. We're back ringside for the lightweight championship match in the Army Combatives Tournament, here on Close Combat. I'm Van Stokes, back with Matt Larson. Now for the final fight in the lightweight class. Let's meet the fighters. Neil Chitwood and Donnie Bowen fought for the gold in the championship. Here's their pre-fight strategy. Uh, I have been here before. This is my uh, fourth year. Uh, I love the program. I love coming down here to train and uh, fight with fellow soldiers. A lot of people, yeah, are afraid to do combatives just because they're afraid of getting hurt and everything, but we, we lose more guys playing soccer, 
you know, twisting her ankles and everything. But this is what we need. We need this. Uh, my strategy today is to stay on my feet as long as possible and uh, control the ring. Uh, from there, I like to uh, feel him out and take him to the ground when I feel it's ready and uh, finish the fight with submission. I want to knock him out. I want to knock him out because my whole mentality anyways, I'm not a competitive fighter. You know, this is fun. I like this. Um, but I'm not a competitive fighter. I like to finish the fight. So Chitwood wants to get Bowen to submit, and Bowen wants to knock out Chitwood. What kind of strategy is that? Well, these are two very experienced fighters. Both of them have been in this tournament for several years. They're both phenomenally skilled, so we're really going to see some action here. Well, each fighter experienced and each fighter trying to win the gold medal. Let's get to the action. Neil Chitwood out in the blue belt and his opponent Donnie Bowen from Fort Campbell wearing the red belt. Chitwood with the ROTC unit at Capital University in Columbus Ohio and Bowen special forces soldier at Fort Campbell Kentucky. Both experienced. Bowen trying to go inside with the knee. In fact, they clashed knees, each trying to strike the other. Very good exchange of knee strikes here. Very, very solid. Seems like one of them would try a takedown off of those knees in a second, but they're hurting each other. Well, there's a takedown by Chitwood as Bowen goes to his back. Seemed like Bowen almost wanted that at that point. Once Chitwood started the action, he just let it go. Trying you to heard, pass the guard there. You heard Bowen just a little bit say that there were more injuries in soccer and football perhaps than there is in this particular activity, Matt. It's true. You know, the, in the Army, there's a big misconception that this is, causes injuries, but it causes very few. At the, at the Army Combative School for Bending, Georgia, there, there are almost no injuries. I think in the last two years, we've had one person drop from a class from injury. It's just very, very safe. What's the worst injury you've seen? The worst injury I've seen in the history of the program was a, was a broken arm uh, in one of the tournaments. And that's the worst injury a tournament we've had. Broken arm. Now, not, not to make light of that, because that can be serious and, of course, uh, detrimental to whoever's arm it might be. But compared to some of the other injuries that you see in some organized sports, that's not considered as bad perhaps as, as some of those other injuries. No, the, there's misconceptions out there about what is dangerous. You know, probably the most dangerous sport in the, in the Army is basketball. The more knees and ankle injuries from basketball than, than there are from fighting, that's for sure. Well, what's the biggest danger right now to Donnie Bowen in the down position? Well, Chip Wood, you can see, he's using his left foot there to try to pry open that half guard and get past. It looks like Donnie's holding on. He really needs to get his left arm under. You can see him digging in, digging in there, trying to get an underhook. But Chitwood, once again, a very experienced fighter. He knows exactly what he's doing here. Now, you got a good look at the referee's foot. I mean, is there any rule that says you have to be shoeless or you can wear shoes if you wish? No, the referee could wear that or he could wear wrestling shoes if he wanted. Okay. And tell us where these referees and judges come from. Well, the referees and judges both are, are instructors at the U.S. Army Combative School at Fort Benning, Georgia. And this one here is a Brandon Sales. He's a three-time Army champion. It's unfortunate as the cadre there, he doesn't get to compete this year. He'd be the very first four-time Army champion if he won. But after he leaves the school, he'll get his chance. Well, back to the standing position comes Neil Chitwood and Donnie Bowen. It's like Bowen really going for that knockout, just yeah. like he said. He said that's what he wanted to do. He says, I want to knock him out, and there he goes at it. Some solid blows landed there. He is relentless in his striking and his attacks to the head of Chitwood. Chitwood said, enough with that. Down you go, my friend. <laughs> yeah, the best defense to punch is his <laughs> tackle. <laughs> best defense of punching is put your man on his back. He can't. <laughs> it's hard to punch someone when you're lying on your back, is it not? No, you know, fighting's a game of range. There's... There's punching range, and then there's clinching range, and now grappling range. Very hard to, uh, very hard to land, to, to stop a person who's trying to get you down if what you want is to hit him. Well, you got to credit Neil Chitwood because he really neutralized that punching attack of 
Donnie Bowen. And he's right back on top in the half guard. He's in solid position. Looks like Bowen's just holding on down there. Doesn't, not moving his butt the way he needs to to get out of that position. About 50 seconds remaining in this period. Who has the edge right now, Matt? Well, I think Bowen got the better of the strikes in the, in the first round, uh, or in the first portion of the round. Um, Chitwood got two of the takedowns, but he hasn't capitalized on them much. So at this point in the round, even though he's on the bottom, I think Bowen might be winning. 10-point must system. It might be a 10-9. Yeah, probably 10-9. I don't think it's dominant. But a nice flurry, very nice flurry earlier on by Donnie Bowen. Chitwood sprawled in an attacking position from the top. There's the pound to the mat, which signifies less than 10 seconds remaining. You saw Stool starting to come into the corner already. A couple of head blows by Chitwood, and the bell sounds to end the period. Yeah, he's, he's not doing much from that half guard position. He really needs to get up and, and make some space in order to drop some punches. Let's give a listen. That's Chitwood's brother there, his coach, who's a very good martial arts teacher and martial arts coach in his own right. And Donnie Bowen is coached by John Rankin, who's been running the program at 5th Special Forces Group and Fort Campbell for quite some time. Yeah, the 101st Airborne Division has used the services of John Rankin to develop the combatus program at Fort Campbell for a while. And quite honestly, he's done a very nice job. The interesting thing about John is he's a... He's not only a professional fighter with over 70 fights, but he's also a preacher. And his whole ministry is about manly Christianity. All right, here we go. And you see both combatants trying to get the crowd into it just a little bit. Start of the second round in the blue, Neil Chitwood from the ROTC unit at Capital University in Columbus, Ohio, and Donnie Bowen. Special Forces soldier from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Oh, oh big takedown. Chitwood, and down goes Bowen. Big takedown. I think Chitwood has decided he doesn't want to trade punches. <laughs> I would say that's a pretty good decision. What would you say? Oh, I agree. <laughs> so Chitwood on the attack from the top position right now. Neutralized certainly the punches of Donnie Bowen. Bowen's got his arms pretty wrapped up, hard to do much damage, but Chitwood's going to have to get busy. They're going to stand him back up. Yeah, if you if you were Bowen's coach, what would you be telling Bo Bowen now from from the side of the ring? Well, I would actually tell him to push him away and try to get his hips and stand back up. It looked like he was doing a lot of damage on his feet. But you do take a risk, do you not, Matt? When you try to scramble and get back to your feet, you expose yourself to a certain degree? You can, but if you're if you're pushing and controlling the range between you, you'll be the one who controls it. Of course, Chitwood is just pushing into him right now, maintaining that position. Doesn't seem to be doing much. Except trying to go upstairs to the head, and, and you were right on that call, Matt. Referee will bring him back to the standing position in the center of the ring. I think next time it goes down, Chitwood's going to have to be a little busier oh. if he wants to keep it up. There's a good blow. Good shot by Bowen, and Chitwood said, shame on you. That's <laughs> not going to happen again. And note this takedown, he got past the guard on the takedown. I think the longer Chitwood stays on his feet and trades blows with Donnie Bowen, the more he is hurt. Yeah, this one of the things on our... <laughs> There's Brandon they, Sales pulling him out of the ring. That is a technique by an official that you just don't see in a lot of sports, <laughs> period. But yeah. that is something. Back to the center. There's no need to stand him up, he says. I don't want to take the advantage away from Neil Chitwood, so I'm just going to kind of bring him back to the center of the ring myself. Not a bad maneuver. Well, 280-pound, two, three-pound, arm, three-time Army champion. This. <laughs> I guess he's earned the right to bring him back to the center. Huh? That's right. <laughs> you can see Chitwood traded sides there on him. Maybe he feels better attacking from that other side. He's gone around to Bowen's right side. Starting to find the range up on the head just a little bit. He's dropping those knees into his back. That's got to hurt. Uh, yeah, you can see that knee going into the lower back area. It's a pound, if you will. 
See, Bowen is giving him the back to hit there. I think I would turn the other way if I could and put your knee in the way. Every time he raises that leg to strike, you have a chance to block it with your knee. And, and Matt, there's an aggregate effect of all those blows, is there not? I mean, it's not just the one blow, not just the one strike, but it's, it's the total, the aggregate. Exactly. As, the, as those muscles start to get those blows, they start to swell, especially in the ribs like that. It's going to make it harder for him to breathe. Wear him down. Chitwood striking with his knees to the back of Donnie Bowen appears to be in, I'm going to call dominant control right now of this period. Yeah, you see, see where Chitwood's right arm is underneath? That's how you can tell he's in control. He's got, that's called an underhook. And so he's controlling what Bowen's shoulder girdle is doing. You can see it there pretty clearly. He's wrapping up that arm. And that keeps Bowen from getting out on the backside. He's busy with the knee, the right knee, into the backside of Donnie Bowen. And occasionally, he'll get a, a blow, a strike to the head, just like that, two of them. Bowen, oh, and a pound to the head. Bowen is in a tough position right now, is he not? He really is, and he's got to fight his left arm into a better position. That, that's really key. Most of what's going on here is dictated by where their arms are. But you can see, every time Chitwood raises that leg up to strike, there's a chance to get that knee in the way. We're under one minute to go in this round. A lot of times when you're, when you're on the bottom, the, the, the inclination is to just hold on, but that's not always the best thing to do. The bottom guy needs movement. He needs to open up the game a little bit so he can get some room to escape. You can see those knees are really going to hurt him. Oh, he has delivered, I don't know how many of those knee blows to the backside of Donnie Bowen, but he has taken a pounding on the bottom position. And the more of this you see, you just see that scorecard shifting for this period. That's right. I think it's pretty clear that Chitwood is winning this round. Less than 10 seconds to go. Chitwood very, very much in control of Bowen. And there's the bell to end the period. Round two comes to a close. And if you're Donnie Bowen, you're, you're somewhat glad that it did. <laughs> yeah, he was in a bad way there. <laughs> I think at this point, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty even. Let's hear what they say. I don't care about that. Come on, come on, come on. All right? You've got to stop the takedown and knock him out this round. It's one round to one round. We cannot give him another takedown. Okay? One round to one round. Give it a sip. Okay? You've got to stop the takedown. You've got to stop the takedown. Every single time. That guy's just pretty clear. Stop the takedown and put him away. Knock him out. That's right. And I think his coach is right on the money. He's just going to come up punches. When he comes in, you can get up and lift him. He's going to pressure. He has to pressure. He's behind. You heard that. He's got a pressure. He's behind. When he comes in, you get up under him and lift it. I guess as the judges have it, just like Rankin said, one round each at this point. So there, it depends on which way it goes. Everything's on the money just in this round. Again, not how you start, but how you finish inside the ring and on the battlefield as well. Well, we're into the final five minutes, third final determining round for this lightweight gold medal. Neil Chitwood on the right with the blue belt, Donnie Bowen on the left with the red belt. And Matt, it might well be tied up one round apiece at this point. I think so. And they both look pretty fresh at this point, too. Now, that's a good sign. Though. A lot of stamina as Bowen tries to land some blows. And very quickly, Chitwood takes him right back down. Remember, John Rankin told Donnie Bowen, don't get taken down. And he did. That's funny. One of the dynamics in this kind of fighting is if you, if you want to be aggressive, you have to be the better fighter on the ground. Because when you're aggressive, you inevitably end up very close to the person. And so that's when the takedowns happen. And, and a lot of boxers don't know how to be aggressive on the ground because they're used to standing on their feet. Well, it's similar to boxing, too. You know, the tall boxer has a, can't be aggressive most of the time because if he's aggressive against the shorter guy, the shorter guy gets what he wants. He gets to fight inside. Well, they're each trading body blows at this point. You see the left hand of Donnie Bowen very active into the side of Chitwood. Looks like they're standing him up there. So Bowen will have another chance to 
take him out, and Chitwood will have another chance to take him down. Single leg. Pressure over against the ropes, and down goes Bowen. Well, so far this round, it looks like Chitwood's having his way. If, if Bowen doesn't get some ability to stop that takedown, I think Chitwood will take this round and end up winning two to one. Two rounds no. to one. He is in a very good position right now over Fort Campbell soldier Donnie Bowen. He has wrapped him, smothered him looks, tight up high. It looks like Bowen's flat on his back, too, and that's not the place you want to be. See, every time Shitwood pulls his right arm up, Bowen needs to be fighting that arm into the armpit, his left arm into the armpit, just like that. He's got to be there in order to control that position. But Chitwood held that right arm down to the mat for a lengthy period. Well, in that last round, that's how he dominated. He was able to control that arm in the far side, keep his own underhook. That's really where the fight is. If Bowen would scoot his hips out to the left, he could pretty soon be threatening the position. You can see Chitwood using that left toe there to try to open those legs up, get his leg free. But he continues to pound, does Neil Chitwood. He'll pound to the body. He'll pound to the head. He'll pound to the face. It doesn't make any difference that they're both in the down position. He'll continue to pound. Well, see how Bowen is using his forearm to hold those punches back? Those punches aren't hurting too much because that forearm is in the way from a powerful blow. I mean, this is almost like a physical chess match when you get right down to it. One move meant to neutralize or take out the move of your opponent. On a scale of one to 10, how high is the intensity right now? It looks like the <laughs> Bowen may be fading a little bit. We'll see what he's got. He's just been taken down twice in this round. Seems like Chitwood's ahead. Latter part of the third stanza. This one could decide the whole thing. Chitwood decides to land a few blows, and then he goes in. And another takedown. To take him down. This is slightly different. You can see where Bowen's feet are on the inside. That's called the butterfly guard. There's certain advantages to that. Different attacks you can make from that position. Should Bowen have stepped around perhaps and not allowed the takedown? He, he, he should have kept his hips back. But since when he was trying to commit to those punches, remember his plan was mm -hmm. to knock him out. So when trying to commit to those punches, sometimes you're not really defending the takedown. When you're on your back like that, it's exceptionally hard to knock out your opponent. And that's exactly right. You don't see too many knockouts from the bottom. We're under one minute to go, and this is the final stanza, round number three of this three-round championship match, lightweight division. Neil Chitwood in the top position with the ROTC unit at Capital University in Columbus, Ohio. Donnie Bowen from Fort Campbell on the bottom. I think if I was Bowen, I'd be trying to open it up some. It looks like he's losing this round and with it, the fight. Chitwood has his arm locked underneath and, and, and Bowen has it grasped hard. Now Chitwood comes back with the right and they kind of trade blows. Less than 10 seconds to go in this championship bout. Oh, oh, oh. There goes the foot to the head of Bowen. Uh. Stomps him in the head, a glancing blow from the side of his foot, the sole of his foot across the face. And that's going to do it. Under 10 seconds to go. Neil Chitwood disqualified. Kicking to the head, and Donnie Bowen wins this lightweight gold medal. Well, clearly, a, clearly an illegal technique there. The Got winner it. Winner in the lightweight, in the red, a winner by disqualification, Fort Campbell, Donnie Bowen. Wow. Bowen is struggling from behind, Matt, and then all of a sudden, Chitwood kicks him in the head. Explain this. How'd that happen? What does it mean? Well, it means he let his blood get up and lost his mind. You know, just like on the battlefield where you have to operate within rules of engagement. You have to operate within rules of engagement here, and those are the, those are the rules. And, and clearly, a kick to the head is an illegal technique when they're, when they're down. You know, Bowen was both hands and feet on the ground, kicking a down opponent. Not okay.
It only takes one second to turn the tide like that, to stop thinking about what you're doing and put yourself in a bad position. Now, the referee could have decided that it wasn't egregious and just taken a point away from him, but at that point, it would have meant the fight anyway, and I think he made the right call. I think, I think a, a kick to the head of a downed opponent is just bad. It's just too bad to let go. Well, we have a new lightweight champion. Congrats to Donnie Bowen of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, winning gold in the lightweight division. For Matt Larson and myself, this is Close Combat. Here we go!